Welcome back and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Amon Chandel and I am Head of Relationship Management at the Natural Resources Forum. On behalf of all of our ESG Week forum sponsors and panel sponsors, we thank you for tuning in for a very special Panel 7 of ESG Week on Mining for Diversity and Inclusion, very kindly hosted by Women in Mining UK. Before we officially start today's webinar, I would like to run through the usual housekeeping points. Please note, we are recording today's event and we will be taking questions from our audience via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar will be available for playback on the Natural Resources Forum website. To our panelists, please note, we are not observing Chatham House rule. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce you to our moderator today, Alex Buck, Managing Director at Women in Mining UK. Alex Buck has over 15 years of investor relations, corporate communications and crisis management experience in the mining industry. Alex started her career at Brunswick Group, the well-known global financial communications agency before joining the Investor Relations Department at the global gold miner Anglo Gold Ashanti. Alex is currently heading up ESG and corporate communications at Endeavor Mining. Alex, thank you for joining us this afternoon and bringing together such a stellar lineup of panelists. I would like to hand our panel over to you now. Thank you, Amon, and hello, everybody. Thank you very much to the Natural Resources Forum for giving Women and Mining UK the opportunity to host this panel. Um, and thank you very much to my panelists for joining today. Before we start, I thought it'd be useful if each of the panelists could briefly introduce themselves. Um, and I think we'll start alphabetically with Edwina. Hi, I'm Edwina Abaikwamwa, and I recently transitioned to the role of Senior Manager inclusion and diversity at a Newmont Corporation's global office. After leading the talent acquisition and inclusion and diversity work in the Africa region, Newmont is the leading gold mining company in the world and we currently have operations in four continents, Australia, Africa, North America, and South America. I'm passionate about inclusion and diversity and excited to be here to share some insights as well as some of the great things Newmont is doing in this space. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Edwina. Sandra. Hi, everyone, and, and thanks again for having me. Um, I'm um, Sandra Bates, a trained lawyer, um, ranging from Freshfields, where I started, Scadden Arps, a few of the big names in large law. And then I've been partner at a law firm, Steichman Elliott, a Canadian law firm, where I guess my um, love affair with mining and mining companies came about. And most recently, in the last couple of years, I have joined the board of, um, of two different mining companies, um, Adriatic Metals and, and Pensana PLC. So yes, I've had um, some recent experience and um, quite a lot of experience advising boards, as you can imagine, on transactions, M&A, capital markets deals, um, and also ESG. Great to be here. Thanks, Andrew. Danielle. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. So to introduce myself, my name is Danielle Hatton and I'm a principal consultant here at Granger Reefs. We are the Sunday Times award-winning executive search firm. And as a principal consultant in the natural resources sector here, I really specialize within the mining and metals industry, collaborating with our clients across the junior, mid-tier and tier one mining space on operational, technical and senior level leadership search assignments. I deliver executive search consultancy and advisory services to our client base across North America, South America, the EMEA region and also Australasia regions as well. Great, thank you. Tanya. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya Chedaeva and I'm company secretary and uh, director of corporate governance uh, at Polymetal International PLC. Uh, Polymetal is a top 10 gold uh, producer and top five silver producer in the world. Uh, and uh, we are listed on the London Stock Exchange and our constituents on um, FTSE 100. Uh, I work a lot with the board and I'm in charge of, among other things, uh, for compliance with uh, diversity requirements. 
and uh, I uh, work a lot with the board to ensure that diversity is on top of agenda and we have different programs that support women in uh, Blumenthal. Great, thank you. Denise? Hi, I'm Denise Wilson. I'm Chief Executive of formerly the Hampton Alexander Review, now called FTSE Women Leaders Review. Um, prior to that, I also sit on several boards, uh, both corporate, uh, charity and not-for-profit boards. And prior to that, spent my corporate career in the oil and gas sector. So not too dissimilar to issues facing the mining sector, actually. And thanks for having me. Thanks so much. And Andrew. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Ray, CEO of Golden Star Resources. We're a gold producer with operations in Ghana in West Africa. Um, diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion is really a key strategic imperative for us, part of the broader ESG plank to our strategy and something that we're pursuing actively through a number of initiatives. So very much looking forward to the panel and to the conversation. Great, thank you. Um, I'm conscious that um, the National Resor Natural Resources Forum gave us a very broad um, topic, um, mining for diversity and talent. Um, since WIM UK is hosting, um, we, I thought we would um, sort of spend most of our time really talking about gender diversity, um, not least because Women in Mining UK's uh, mission is to um, attract, retain um, and employ women in the mining industry. Um, we'd love to make this interactive. There's a Q&A chat that, that Emil mentioned. So if you'd like to send questions through as you think of them, we'll, you know, we'll incorporate them. Um, and I thought we'd, we'd, we'd kick off sort of starting, I guess, at, at, at leadership and kind of the current situation. Um, so Denise, I know that there was a report that came out um, recently. Um, what's your view of, of sort of where we're at? I mean, it's, I think, um, been about 10 years since you launched the first Hampton Alexander report. Is enough being done? Do we need to do more? What's your view? And given that you look at FTSE 350 businesses, where does mining fit in? Because we often think we're laggards, are we? <laughs> okay, great. Um, look, you, you know, I think as most of you all know, the UK has been working pretty hard on the subject of gender diversity and, and latterly much harder as well on on racial and black and ethnic minority diversity and other forms, and all of which are matter. There is no hierarchy here. But clearly, um, the UK started on gender. 50% of the workforce uh, and the population and our university leavers are women. And I, and I think if you can make headway there, then that's a very good um, signal and a very good starting point for exploring other areas of diversity. The UK chose a different route to most other countries, particularly the European Union, which has gone specifically down uh, the legislative quota route. So no choice, no option, often very short timescales, uh, a, a, set, uh, a set quota for usually 40% uh, women on boards or in leadership teams and fines and penalties, some quite severe fines and penalties, uh, including delisting removal of the chair or the CEO for not achieving those. The UK felt uh, after much study and consultation that that wasn't quite in keeping with our business ethic and, and, and also felt actually, you know, this isn't that hard. We can, we can solve this one quite quickly. I think 10 years on, we're finding that actually it's not quite as easy as we thought it was to crack. Um, but we have made really good progress by adopting a voluntary persuasive route. So a series of quotas, firstly 25% for the first five years latterly 33%, uh, watch this space, there will be a, a higher target and quota coming for this third and successive phase. But what I would say is that it has worked well for British business, um, you know, from a really what was a very low starting point. So if we start with boards and you look at the FTSE 350, in 2010, women's representation on FTSE 350 boards was 9%. It's now 34, 35%. You know, that is significant progress um, by any measure. And the FTSE 100 is currently at 38%. If you compare us to other European countries, let's take France, which is currently the leader, they're at 42% women. But having had a very penal regime uh, and a very compliance regime, you know, there's no, this is, this is a complex modern business world problem to solve, the lack of diversity in leadership. And there is no silver bullet. We know that now. There is no one fix all. 
uh, it is a multifaceted, multi-year, uh, multi-layer, multi-year approach that makes makes progress. And I, I think we've seen that in the UK. I would also say that the insights that we have into what are really, really complex barriers facing anybody who presents differently in business to a to a, a senior white male uh, are compounding and and are taking some 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 breaking down but we do have fantastic information on that now there is one piece of credible research comes out every single week um, uh, about british business and about diversity in british business we've just got further to go on that road uh, in order to 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 really crack this nut which is proving hard I, i think a good sign is that we're dealing with very some of the very difficult issues the most difficult issues such as gender stereotyping, bias in the selection process, and behaviors in the workplace, workplace culture, workplace attitudes. And they're, you know, they're not easy to, to break down and change quickly. But that is where we're at. So I, I think the fact that we haven't taken the tick box uh, route is, has been good for us, but we've still got clearly a long way to go. Uh, not enough women in chair roles and sit roles. We only have around 40 of the FTSE 350 where we have a woman chair. And those really big, important roles in leadership, so the CEO and the FD, uh, eight CEOs in the FTSE 100. And and a statistic that often surprises people, particularly uh, male colleagues, is that currently today, despite 10 years of progress uh, and all of the discussion and all of the, frankly, really big efforts that are going on in business to change this dynamic, today, 66% of all roles on FTSE boards and in FTSE leadership which is a population of 23,000 people, 66% of all of those roles are still currently going to men. Gosh. So we have a long way to go. Yes. Do you want me Um, to touch on the sector or do you want (laughs) to uh, leave that there? Well, I might, I might cut, well, I have one question for you, but then I, I, I'd very much like to also hear Sandra's views, um, um, given, you, you know, she's, she's now in the boardroom and, and sort of looking at, but, but one quick question for you, Denise, is um, targets and linking them to executive compensation. You obviously mentioned we've chosen not to go the penal route. Um, however, do you, have, have you seen those companies that have chosen to have executive compensation linked to targets, have they, have they fared better? Is that... Um, yeah, look, I mean, it needs a multifaceted approach. So there are several things, but there are two things that I would probably draw out as being fundamentally important to those companies that have made the most progress. And the first one is the attitude, the appetite and the courage of the leader. And by that, I mean the chair of the board or the CEO in the organization and their staying power. And that, when you know, when the leader gets it, and and they mean it, then everybody kind of lines up underneath and things change very quickly. So that's really, really important. And the second one is you have just drawn attention to, I would say is executive pay being targets, um, bonuses uh, and performance appraisals, frankly, being linked to progress that's being made in this space uh, in diversity and inclusion. And that is when you really start to get not just senior leaders, but middle managers attention on this topic too. You know, we're all very focused on uh, on what goes in our back pocket, aren't we? And this subject's no different to any other business issue. Okay. So, Sandra, I- I'd love to sort of hear your perspective. I mean, Denise has been talking FTSE. You know, you're an NED of, of several AIM-listed companies that, you know, have similar similar challenges, but then, you know, does size make a difference? And I wonder, I- I'd-, I'd be interested in your perspectives now that you're in the board looking out what your observations would be around some of the the issues that Denise has touched on particularly around culture and trying to affect change and thinking about that future pipeline of of, of female leaders. Thanks Alex. Um, Yes so I've seen uh, and I've I've started to see a difference and more opportunities coming up um, at the junior sort of end of the spectrum for the last two or three years now so that that has been a real change before that um i don't think you had investor interest on this subject but um, make no mistake it's the investors that are driving this change um at the, at the junior end and and that uh, again to your back pocket point denise um you know that's what matters to companies they they need funding um and so that that has been really helpful um i make no about the fact that you know I, I got the call because they needed a female 
in this role, as well as someone with my skill set, but but the fact that I was female was was perversely an advantage. You know, so having battled away for 20 odd years in an exec career, it's it's um it's odd to find yourself in this position. But in any event, um, I would say that shouldn't uh, prevent anyone from walking in with extreme confidence because we all we all know where uh, where our skills lie and and what we have to offer companies. So um, I think you've just got to get on with it if the opportunity arises. Uh, once you're once you're in there, I mean, uh, as always, I think people will take some time to see the lay of the land and understand the dynamics in the boardroom uh, before you sort of pile in with with any um, particular agenda. And that you know that sort of networking piece, I, I don't think was particularly obvious to me before I I started, but that clearly became. Um, you know, became obvious and you, know, you pick up the phone. It's like it's like any relationship. Good communication is absolutely key as to how effective you can be in the boardroom. It's not the set piece monthly or quarterly meetings. Uh, you know, it's it's having your finger on the pulse. Um, I, I, I'm hugely um, aware that the the chairman role is, is incredibly important in affecting change. So as Denise says, having a chairman and a CEO who get it uh, will make all the difference. So it comes down to the personality at the end of the day. And I think that that's changing sort of over the generations, but um, that just makes a, makes a huge difference. Um, once, you're, once you're in there, um, the positions I see is really important to, to take that next step, particularly looking at the executive ranks, um, is to have one functioning nominations committees. And I think all too often, and this comes from a history of advising boards um, over the years, but the nominations committee can can involve a bit of window dressing. And actually it's, you know, it's it's the CEO or a major shareholder or, or others who are deciding, you know, who is on the shortlist even for those key management roles and NED seats that come up. And so I think there needs to be as a as a female on the board or anyone um, interested in, in affecting change and, divert and improving the diversity of a business, uh, having a focus on that, putting your hand up to be on the norms committee and probably the remuneration committee because to Denise's point, everyone's focused on Remcom <laughs> at some certain times of the year. And that, um, you know, that is where you can, you can have an influence. So I might I might pass over to Andrew at this stage because um, having done some research, Andrew, I, I know you're close to board parity. I mean, you've got four out of your 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 ten um, uh, directors um, are women. Um, at your exco, um, I think it's it's around two out of five. Um, picking up on on sort of Sandra and Denise, I, I mean, I how do you help work with your board to kind of continue that road towards gender parity? But then also make sure that, you know, there is that feeling of, oh, well, they were just appointed because they were a woman, as opposed to actually they were appointed because they are a skilled professional. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point, Alex. Um, you know, the way I look at it is we, there are four women on our board, all from different backgrounds, all really strong women, strong characters that add so much to the functioning of the board. I mean, I'd say to anybody else that is looking at this as a challenge don't look at it that way it's a massive opportunity because i think our board as a result functions an awful lot better and you know the input we get the different views and opinions diversity of opinions that we get just makes us a better company so you know something i believe strongly in to sandra's point our chair believes strongly in because i think we can see the benefits and the same applies in the exec team as well that I think we just get a better quality of leadership and dialogue and you know it's critical to give that example to show those role, role models to younger people younger women either looking at coming into the business or coming into the business and seeing you know these people from different backgrounds who've got to the very top of the company and show there aren't barriers in that business to that i think it you know for us as a smaller business i think to me that's a no-brainer because it's a competitive advantage when then hiring so that's a nice segue um in, into I, I guess the, the next sort of section that i'd like to look at which is the retention piece so, you, you know what are we doing to make sure that those women that that you know have the high potential but aren't quite yet 
in the leadership role, but are you know working their working their way up. Um, how do we make sure that that we keep them engaged and and feeling that you know they they will have the opportunity for their sort of ultimate ambition and whether that's C-suite and or or MD. Um, at Newmont, I mean, I, I guess Newmont is another one I should mention in terms of board parity because obviously um, you reached that last year. But uh, it we know you know when you look at diversity and inclusion and you think about how you're going to motivate those women. What are the types of um, programs that you have in place? Okay, thank you, Alec. So our current position as a business is that we are doubling down on our efforts in the inclusion and, and diversity space. So all our efforts are underpinned by our value of inclusion where we want to continuously create that environment for employees to have the opportunity to fully contribute, develop and work together to achieve our strategy. And as a business, we've identified that certain basic symbols of exclusion need to be eliminated in the business. It is the basic thing to do to ensure that you are retaining um, your, your workforce and more especially um, our female. So we have done extensive um, exercise as at identifying some basic symbols of exclusion, such as even PPs and uniforms for women um, that fit, ensuring that the women's bathroom is not doubling as a storage facility. And we also have gender neutral uh, bathrooms. We are also working at taking off signs such as men at work or even manpower plan from some of the discussions that we are undertaking. And these steps, though simple, have gone to show that they are very impactful. In the recent McKenzie report that came out in September 2021, one of the reasons why women leave the mining industry is that um, they, they do not belong or they are not fitting in. So we recognize that if we eliminate some of these basic symbols of exclusion, um, it, it does help in retention. And one of the key things also is that we need to ensure that our leaders are in touch with our female employees in the organization um, to truly understand the challenges of the women in the workplace. There's the need to improve engagement and also proximity. And so recently, our CEO, Rob Atkinson, um, and his operations and also project team took a simple action of speaking to three women deep down in the organization, asking the question as to what it is like to work at Newmont. And obviously there, there were some um, responses um, that came out that we are using to, um, the positive obviously we are using to reinforce our behaviors and some of the areas that we need to ensure that we are working at addressing um, we are doing that and also i want to talk about business resource groups these are employee led um, but they are executive um, sponsored so these are common um, groups with common interests dedicated at improving inclusion and diversity um, at, at newmont currently we have about 26 business resource groups globally and eight of them are focusing on advancing and um, in the workplace. These groups help us to identify some of the challenges and helps to also um, improve them. So um, these are some of the things that we are doing as a business to um, improve retention. Thank you, Edwina. I, I want to come back to you on a point about male, inclu male inclusion, as it were. But I'll come to that in a moment. Just, just quickly, Danielle. Um, uh, Edwina had been talking about obviously removing um, and some of those obvious signs around, you know, men at work. Um, for a while now, there's been talk around making sure that um, CVs um, and or job descriptions are gender blind. Um, and I think that's that's becoming much more commonplace. But when you think about, you know, the high, high, high potential women that you're talking to, and then in light of perhaps some of the opportunities that have, have, have arisen out of the pandemic and so far as the work from home, flexible rosters, what are you seeing now from your from 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 these 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 candidates and what are they looking for? Thank you, Alex. So what I would say is that when it comes to recruitment and our client base, what we are seeing is that they are far more proactive and they are considering far more broader experience 
when considering candidates for um, future leadership positions. We, as you mentioned, surrounding uh, gender blind CVs, for example, I would always say that the job description is also incredibly important. I've always said that the job description is job description is almost like this wish list of the ideal candidate and where traditionally we wouldn't step away from this what our clients are far more open to is the flexibility of what that job description looks like so the needs of the role versus the wants and they are far more open to, although they have to consider the here and now with the role, but bringing on the individuals who are going to lend to the growth of the company and driving that skill set forward. This goes into using gender neutral language in job descriptions. In our shortlist, we remove pronouns and names from our shortlist to present a more inclusive process. And what I would say that we are seeing with regards to our candidates in COVID is that COVID really forced the hand in the mining industry. We saw flexible working, more attractive shift patterns, skeletal workforces, and it was a huge pilot exercise which was really successful and can provide great attraction to our industry moving forward. And we are seeing our candidates really focus on this moving forward, what can be presented with regards to opportunities by our clients. And our clients are really stepping up when considering the flexibility of positions, the backgrounds of individuals going into these positions and the skill sets required for the future. So an example that I use is that we placed a number of general managers during the COVID um, lockdown isolation period and they worked remotely for four to five months. So what does this mean moving forward? Um, I think we are at this point where the structure of our facilities, such as remote locations and fly in, fly out are really under the spotlight. And if we can bring in those development plans, which can focus on technology, innovation, autonomous um, usage and robotics, we can really lend to the development of people and drive that industry forward as well. Do we really need to hold um, our candidates to relocate for positions or can we work remotely moving forward with site-based allowances? Um, I think with regards to things such as also rotation of talent and rotation of international talent as well, it's really gonna open up the progression opportunity experience even more than it did before. Are you finding your your clients are also very conscious of culture um, and and making sure that you, you know this would be a company that you know that women would want to join? Absolutely. Um, as Edwina mentioned, our clients are incredibly committed to providing better facilities for both men and women, safer environments, the correct PPE, and also moving with the progressions of candidates' needs. So what does succession planning look like? What does the pipeline of talent both internally and externally look like? And where can we look in alternative markets which hold transferable skills to bring in diversity of thought, um, and bring them in early in their career so that they can learn the industry and then progress. Um, what I would also say that they're incredibly passionate around surrounds mentorship. And I know a, a, a client base of mine, they are so open to holding feedback sessions with women, listening to them about their experiences on site, taking those recommendations that they make and actually actioning them as well. It's sessions which are led by women for women. Okay. I, 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 there are a few points there that I, I will come back to, but but just, um, Edwina, you, you were talking about, um, obviously, the work that, that, that Newmont have been doing around um, the, the inclusion piece of, of women or ensuring that, that they are part of it. How does a company make sure that this, that, that both, that everyone feels um, included and that you know we get the support of our male allies and that we're, it's not it, it doesn't end up being seen as, as kind of slightly them and us so allyship is very important to us because we believe it's an enabler for true progress so you rightly mentioned too much focus on diversity numbers only 
could create fear among the majority group, which in this case is, is our men. So what we have done is that we bring the men along the journey. So for our business resource groups, for example, the women, we call it the women and allies, because men tend to understand some of when they join this journey, they come to understand um, the issues that women face and they are in place of responsibility, accountability and authority. So we bring them uh, along, along you know, the journey. Antonia, I'd love to sort of hear, 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 you know, Polly Mattel's perspective, because again, you, you know, you, you've been doing a, a lot of work around this. Um, but I think, you know, we have to recognize that it's not always a journey that everyone is on board with. And, um, and you, you know, we have to also be sensitive around, you know, um, concerns. Uh, yes, in Polymetal, we uh, look very practically at uh, the issue of diversity, and we think that if you exclude 50% of population from your workforce uh, in the area, which is actually uh, very, very hungry for new people to come into the into the job, we are depriving our company from the talent. So, uh, and we are very grateful to Denise, who led um, Hampton Alexander Review and uh, who helped to focus the board. And we started this process several years ago from the board level and how we approached it is we took uh, a decision to mostly offer uh, board positions to females who never held a board position before because how previously it was done is uh, you go to FTSE 100 or if you're adventurous enough you go to FTSE 350 uh, choose the females and offer them a job and there are far and few between so they very quickly become overboarded and this is doesn't give us the pipeline of females who would be able to get more jobs and more board roles in the future. So out of um, uh, of the recent, in the past three years, we uh, got three new board directors who never held the position before. And as you may, as many of you know, it, 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 it takes time and effort to bring uh, new non-executive directors up to speed if they never held this role before, but we took this specific decision that this is well worth the effort and we see very good progress. And one of such directors is helping us to develop a mentoring program. So we're going deeper down, like every like deeper down in levels. So our next um, uh, focus is to get more uh, females into senior roles. And I think this is the problem which many other mining companies are missing because it's not particularly difficult to appoint board directors and it's reasonably uh, fine to get new uh, females to join the company, but it's very, very difficult to retain them and train them through the ranks to achieve the CIS, like the CIS uh, uh, level in the company. So this is our new focus of attention. And as part of that, we developed uh, several mentoring programs. For example, two of those uh, are uh, chief geologist and uh, chief female engineer. And we have focus groups. We have um, uh, we identified the females who will be capable of achieving the highest levels in the company. For uh, chief engineer, for example, we have one of the female board uh, members who are starting to mentor them because uh, it's it's working in a mine is difficult. There is no denial that it is a hard job and you shouldn't be saying that it's all nice and easy and we are very far away from uh, remote mines. So what we're doing is we're showing an example that a female can actually do this job and can do it very successfully. So this is currently our uh, main focus of attention in ensuring that we have uh, females uh, staying in the company and uh, achieving uh, really good results. Thank you. We've had our first question um, and, and actually it ties nicely into just where I, I wanted to go, which is um, what do we need to do to get more women to join my, because I think, you know, if we get greater numbers coming in, then, you know, if, if we find that, you know, a few drop off with the retention, at least you've still got a, a solid core. Um, and, and here I'm going to unashamedly thank Tanya and Andrew, or I should say Golden Star and Polly Mattel, because both have done some fantastic work with Women, women in Mining UK around scholarships and internships. Um, and I think it's important that we show that, you know, there is a great career um, ahead of them. Andrew, would you like to talk a bit about how what you're doing to, to ensure that there really are good opportunities? So not only is, 
is someone going to join Golden Star early on in their career, but they're actually going to be able to see a pathway to think, well, why would I want to move? I, I can, you know, I can see a five, 10 year plan ahead. Um, no problem at all, Alex. I think just actually bearing in mind the question that came in and um, linking that previous conversation we were having around the role of men um, and as the, the minority man on the panel, which is an unusual situation, but uh, a good one for me to be in. I think I, a couple of points worth making there that um, I think one of the keys to actually making progress is getting men to understand that there's an issue. Because to be perfectly honest, as a man, you don't come across these issues in your everyday life. They're not something you face. So I'd say to everyone, don't be shy about reminding your bosses and men in the company that these are real issues. And we've all got our unconscious biases, which play into that as well, I think. So there's an educational part to predominantly the decision makers are men. So they've got to understand that it's an issue before change is really affected. Um, and I think, you know, that there's plenty more that can be done there. I make a point, we've got a few strong women in the business at some of the more junior levels of always just asking them to give me an honest view, because I know they will. And I know it will raise issues that I just wouldn't be aware of otherwise. And I just, you know, encourage everybody to do that. Because otherwise, you know, you might have a good pool of potential candidates wanting to join a business, but you don't have the decision makers understanding that they should be targeting that pool. So I think that's the first part. Um, you know, I think that the other angle to it from our perspective is also to show that, you know, we're a small mid-sized producer. And I've often heard the excuse, well, you know, it's up to the bigger companies to drive all these programs because the smaller businesses just don't have the resources and we've got to get the skills. We don't have the time to train. That's rubbish. That, that to me, really is not borne out by fact or reality because, okay, you're smaller, you've maybe got less resources, you get a bit smarter. So you partnership, you know, we do the Women in Mining internship. Um, and I was at site recently to meet the three women that we've got this year with us, which is brilliant. It's great to see them at the start of the process. And I want to go and see them at the end because then, you know, I'll get a real sense of how they've developed. Um, we did it last year successfully. But, you know, we partner with universities to leverage the skill base they've got. We've helped fund and expand a model school very close to our mine, which not only helps educational attainment and makes, you know, the awareness greater of the mine, but it's an attraction for bringing people in, particularly women who are coming in who are thinking about perhaps education of their kids which you know, typically is a concern, and to see that there's good education nearby. So it's about providing that environment in different ways, not just sort of directly making sure that, that women feel comfortable, but that it's a place to actually thrive for a whole family. Um, and that gives the mine a lot better stability in itself as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the operation can get uh, benefits from that. So I think it's broadening where you can access talent and partnering with the local communities. And, you know, we've got um, some initiatives in the local communities where we've got a high proportion of women involved. What that does is I think it just improves the number of role models in the community that, you know, they've got little girls who are going through their education and see their mums involved in business and thriving. And um, that's the perfect role model and others see it. And it brings again, the awareness that, okay, there's opportunity for me here. So I think, you know, we've got to be open. We've got to have the right culture, but then we've almost got to feed that pipeline right from the very beginning and show people that there's a, a route for them to take and ensure that, as I say, the um, decision makers, predominantly men, understand the benefits of doing that.
you, you raise an interesting point about working with 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 schools and universities um, and obviously in the UK you know we're seeing a resurgence of mining um, down in Cornwall but you know it's it's it, it's still you know it's it's not a it's not a primary industry the way that it, it may used to have been um Tanya with polymetal I mean I, I think you were mentioning that that you know thinking about what your future workforce looks like you've actually got very involved with universities to make sure that you are working with them um, to kind of provide the skilled talent that you need uh, yes, I'm like very passionate myself about education and uh, what Sandra said is that we don't our females to feel that they were appointed and promoted just because they're females. So we think that among other things we should provide them really good educational opportunities. And uh, we work, uh, again, like Andrew said, we work a lot with um, communities around our mines. Uh, we invest in schools. We provide training to teachers and have uh, all different like STEM challenges for the schools to ensure that people are interested into actually joining the industry and uh, go into work, maybe not in our company, but still to join the industry. And this is a similar approach that we use, uh, like we're sponsoring the Cambridge School of Mine scholarship uh, jointly with women in mining, is that we look at this with, with very open eyes, that this is not necessarily the female who is going to join Polymetal, but she will be effect as, as effective in any other business. And this will bring the whole industry to a probably slightly different level with more females uh, being uh, visible out there and shown that this is very possible. And uh, one other thing that we are doing, it's um, we somewhat replicated what women in mine in UK are doing uh, in Russia. So we had an award in Russia and there was ceremony a few days ago. And the most inspiring thing that was there is to get all the females who said, oh my God, there are so many other females who are so exceptionally talented. And this just shows you that you are not alone in that boardroom. You are not alone in the mining business. Actually, there are plenty of talent around and we should just share it. That's, that's, that's great to hear. Um, we've had another question come in. What are innovative ways that, uh, that, that, that companies are, are, are implementing to, uh, to ensure their women feel included and really valued? Um, and, um, and I guess there, I, I'd love to hear, I mean, Danielle, given all the clients you work with, you, you, know, you get a sense of the sort of different types of programs. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think it comes back to a number of the topics that we have already covered today that we are undertaking, we are seeing our clients undertake um, mentoring programs with um, both up from entry level candidates up to senior leadership candidates as well. We're looking far more into other industries on why we should be joining the mining sector and utilizing those transferable skill sets and bringing those on board also. And I do think a huge part of this is education. So how are we how are we changing that historic behavior and maybe what the mining industry used to be like? Because it's evolved so much, even in a five year period. So how do we continue to hold training programs, these feedback sessions with women sharing their experiences? Um, areas like Tanya mentioned about females seeing other females in these roles and inspiring them and empowering them to um, continue and progress. And I think that the, the, my key takeaway would be that the more that we talk about this, the more we can create these inclusive cultures, because the more we are hearing, the more we can listen and the more we can change. And this is a key message that I hear from all my clients, that they want to hear more examples so that they can be innovative and change and adapt and improve. One other question that's come in is 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 on that is you know it's great that you know obviously Andrew and 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 well the the miners have been have been doing um, quite a bit of work around making sure that the women on site um, feel included and in getting their feedback. One question and and Sandra, I'm going to put you in the hot seat. One question is you know what about in the corporate office and what about making sure that women in the corporate office. Um, you know, have that opportunity to discuss those 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 challenges, or equally an opportunity to sort of, you know, say actually that joke wasn't so funny and doesn't make me feel so comfortable. You know, how, you know, but how, 
you know <laughs> it's always it's always a tricky one but um it is tricky yeah. i've had a, a recent experience at a um, drinks event where i was approached uh, by two different females actually at different sort of ends of the evening um both of whom had views on how i ought to be behaving in 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 oh. the mining world you know vis -vis with respect to um, men and the comments they make and one of them in particular and, and she had she was you know fairly relaxed by that point in the evening and she she had strong views about a conversation that had just been had and i don't know if it's a generational thing or um, whether I've seen so much in, in my years in the mining industry or else, and being Australian as well, that I'm just desensitized to it. But I, 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 didn't, I didn't see anything wrong with, with um, the language used or what was being discussed or, or anything of the like. But, um, you know, it, again, it comes back to the personalities, but I, I don't think you should have to have a thick skin. I think uh, society is moving on and, you know, the next generation, I believe, are much more comfortable just saying you know that's out of line I'm not going to put up with that um certainly in my advisory world i've had numerous experiences where you know men have not behaved well in the boardroom and, and at some point uh you do have to say and I, you know i've sat waiting for clients to do it on my behalf and and been disappointed frankly so um now i just say we're not going to have that and we're going to move on in a professional way so so that's you know, know yourself, be yourself. I don't think you've got to leave your personality at the door and, you know, behave like the the, um, the well-behaved newbie or female um, anymore. I just, I, I think that's kind of old old hat. Um, I, I think, you know, it's, it's you can only affect change when you're in there. So there's no point in saying, oh, I'm, you know, it's terrible and, and, and not taking opportunities because you're either afraid that you don't fit or, you know, you've, you've, you've kind of do your research but you've got to uh, give it a go and i've always thought that um you know i might have wanted to be a human rights lawyer for example but but actually inside corporates you can affect change you're not a sellout um you know being present and and being available i i'm always available to to speak to to anyone who has you know thoughts about joining boards or or otherwise and i, I probably mentor more um females in the you know, from the legal sector. And I have to say the issues are very, very similar uh, to, to mining companies. You know, it's, it's the same themes coming up. Uh, so do do be proactive in, in picking up the phone to people um, who you see, because I, I've, I've benefited a lot from speaking to a huge range of, of senior women um, who've been there, done that. So Sandra, that's great. And I, I'm sure there'll be a number of panelists that, or uh, sorry, a number of um, our audience that will probably take you up on that and uh, <laughs> and find you on LinkedIn. Um, Denise, um, I just wanted to touch on kind of mentorship versus using political capital and kind of the difference between that um, and, and, and perhaps the importance of it. Um, so what do you mean by political capital? You need to explain well, that. It's to, well, I'm thinking, you know, uh, senior male leaders actually going in rather than just mentoring. Sponsorship, which, maybe. Correct. Yeah. No, I, I, I think um, anecdotally we see in here that women are over-mentored and under-sponsorship, under-sponsored, and I think there's probably some truth in that. Um, if I look back to my own corporate career, you know, I can remember many occasions when we were looking at who would get which role and who would be promoted next and, uh, and trying to validate across various divisions. And it was frustrating in the extreme that every time somebody, um, often me, would put forward a, a Janet for the role, there was always a John that came up who uh male colleagues would think was you know more deserving and then a cacophony of male voices in support of john as well and you know we know that men are very very supportive of one another and frankly it's a helpful thing i think it's a good thing um and and that's the reason why men are often promoted more frequently more often um and with shorter time scales in the job than, than women are because there is huge great allyship amongst amongst men i think I think women need to learn a little bit about that from men because frankly, it's very effective for their own careers. It's very effective for the organization that they work in and, and often for the economy. 
So I, I think there's a huge amount in, um, in, in, in women putting themselves out there a little bit more in the workplace in that both informal way and formal way. But, but um, I, I would say that, that um, you know, I, I think they have limited, I think they have limited mentorship Sponsorship, not so much, but mentoring programs are good and helpful at certain stages in certain places. But actually, these are systemic organizational issues that we're trying to address. It's not individual issues of women or how they behave or what they need or their deficiencies. Sure. You know, organizations that have made most progress treat this like any other business issue. So they don't have a flimsy set of papers that come from, you know, I and D once a quarter with some nice pictures in and, 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 and glossy. Uh, uh, frills. They, they, they are uh, robust papers like they would be on any other subject with graphs and charts, managing performance and metrics, KPIs, um, what are we doing about this, where are we making progress, where are we not, fixes, uh, real accountability and they lift the lid on every single people process from pay to um, bonuses to uh, uh, performance evaluations to who, you know, who gets what job, recruitment, and, and they look at the outputs and balance those up and, and, and they're um, robust and, uh, and keep it on, you know, that's sustained year after year after year. And that's, those are the things that make progress in organisations. It is the organisation attacking and, 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 and breaking down the, you know, the system and the dreadful bias in the selection process. And, and it's there. I mean, we all need to recognise it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. There is no shortage of capable, competent women to fulfil these roles. They just need to get picked. I'm, I'm conscious that we're probably coming towards the end of our panel session. And I think, Denise, you've just given everyone some, some very good food for thought. And if anyone you know, was thinking, well, what can I do today? I think you've given them a whole list of, of things to consider. And, and with that, um, I would like to um, go around the panellists to just say, you know, what else or how what would be your advice to what companies can do or equally individuals um, to to really um, help affect change and ensure that you know when the industry goes out to recruit it's recruiting from 100 percent of the talent pool that it's retaining you know those wonderful high potential women so that you know we we, we do really get a diverse um, leadership as well as keeping an eye on those future generations that will want to join us um, so um, Danielle two or three takeaways. I'm conscious we have about eight minutes left. <laughs> um, I could sit here and talk to you for hours about my key takeaways of what we can do in the industry to attract more women, retain more women and develop more women. But look, I really feel like we are at this pivotal, pivotal point where we have an opportunity to really make change and we can really make a difference. Our superintendents are going to be our future COOs. So we need to be looking at the development plans of our superintendents, what talent we need to be bringing in at this level, whether it be from technology companies who are oversubscribed over or have maybe more representation of women, that we can bring them on board and develop them into our industry to become our future leaders. The industry has evolved so much in the past five years, it's only going to evolve further in the next five to 10. So we have a really great opportunity now to bring in an absolute array of talent. And I really think we need to be open-minded when considering this with the group recruitment of our future leaders. Great, so, so Edwina, <laughs> off the back of, of Danielle's rousing call, you know, what would be, uh, what would be, you know, one of, one or two of your takeaways? Yes, so um, throughout our inclusion and diversity journey, we've come to the realization that we have to be intentional in our efforts. We cannot continue to do things the same way and also expect the required results. So one of the key lessons on our journey is top leadership or senior executive, having them to understand and support the process because they are essential to enable inclusion and diversity. We need visible, strong leaders who are committed, who change the, challenge the status quo. They take bold decision, ask the right questions, and, and also encourage their teams to do the same. We must be willing to set ambitious 
um, goals that disrupt the day-to-day -day progress. So here in Newmont, for instance, for a half or north mine in Africa, um, the leadership that Tom um, in 2018 gave the challenge that we need to reach parity by 2023. And that is what the team in Africa is working tirelessly um, to achieve this. Secondly, we understand that um, what gets measured gets uh, done. So we need to know and understand our data, our baseline, so that we can take steps to improve our intake of women. However, we need to know that numbers alone do not automate an inclusive um, culture. So we need to create a balance between numbers and also um, the culture. We need to think of the drivers, the intake, as well as the retention so that we can have win-win um, at both sides. Thank you, Edwina. Tanya, any any last last thoughts for, because you... Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> uh it's very important to have the right tone from the top and to ensure that uh the board and senior leaders are showing that uh, female is available no discrimination is acceptable that any kind of discrimination will will be told uh, not tolerated so this this is very important and uh, uh i think again like uh, be very open-minded about what you are trying to achieve it's all good to say that you want to hire 100 new female geologists but be very realistic there are no 100 female geologists like going around looking for jobs that you just need to train your own geologist and make sure that you actually invest into this grassroots recruitment thanks tanya andrew any 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 last thoughts um i'd agree with edwina on on be bold so set yourself challenging targets you've got to have a plan to achieve them but you know you've got to be bold to make change and the other one i'd say is communication so to men listen and maybe just understand a bit better what's going on what the dynamics are some of the challenges that women in your organization face and for women i'd say speak up and make sure that the men that you're working with and for understand those challenges thank you and sandra any any final final thoughts from you uh yes so of the the flip side of what andrew's saying is um as an individual you need to you know do your research and know know what you're about but then be brave seize the opportunities that are there back yourself um but demand more from your mentors you know look around your network both on the board and and off it and you know ask questions people are really really open to it take 10 minutes of their time and um and you get a huge amount of uh, you know experience at your disposal which will be really helpful great well thank you very much everybody it's been um a fantastic hour um and um and some great insights um i think you know to denise's point good progress has, has been made but there's still a way to go and um and there's no doubt that you know recruiting from 100 percent of the talent pool is really you know it's good for business it's good for everybody um and really leads to you know a long-term sustainable business once again thank you very much panelists thank you very much the natural resources forum i shall hand over to amon Thank you, Alex, and thank you to all our panelists for joining us this afternoon. On behalf of our ESG Week Forum and panel sponsors, we thank our audience for joining us. Please stay tuned for Panel 8 at 2.30 p.m. BST, A Closer Look, A Company Case Studies. If you're not able to join us, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>